Hey clowns, how's it going? This is Synth Addict here. Um, it's been kind of a crazy week, so the studio tour is a little more sparse than I had planned. Took a while to uh, get some stuff sorted and cleaned up, so it's a little more presentable than normal. Um, it's always, things are changing and getting moved around, as you can imagine with most studios. I'll do a quick setup of all the gear and I'll show you the workflow, how it's plugged in with the, the mixers and such. Mono Evolver desktop. Lisa's Vortex, this is the Depth for Dark Time, great little analog sequencer designed around the old kind of Tangerine Dream style Berlin, Berlin School. Um, lots of different options in there with toggle switches. And I had to throw this one in there for the UK folks. This is the uh, aptly named Time Tosser. So <laughs> I haven't used it much yet, but it's mainly an audio um, effects device, essentially. Um, kind of a stutter, live stutter edit and, and looper kind of tool. Micro Freak, Innovation Controller here, um, Innovation X Station 25, one of my first Innovation products ever. I love this thing. Uh, Nova Engine, an insane control surface, had an audio interface, had the whole works as far as um, uh, templates for, you know, VSTs uh, and stuff, all on the go. Battery operated, joystick, XY pad, uh, beautiful aftertouch on it. A Kai Force, I'm upset about that. You guys all know what that is, especially if you're an NPC user. A Telson Sonics, classic old crappy analog drums from the 80s. Pretty funny stuff. Uh, Roland JDXI, um, classic uh, supernatural sound engine, analog engine, built in effects. I've done a lot of tracks on my channel. Just using this alone, it's like a challenge. How, how much can you build with just this guy? And it, everyone was built with just one, except for my Tangerine Dream Love and Real Train track. I had to get the white one because if you guys know, the standard one is black with red writing, which is impossible to read in low light. And black shiny surface is a magnet for greasy fingerprints. So it just becomes a big mess. Uh, nice little DX7 artwork I got from a friend a long time ago. So it goes into DX7s, kind of fun. Rolly, um Seaboard Rise 25, the first Rolly I bought. Um, I have several of them, but uh, this one's just a, has all the great controls you'd expect from the Rolly. Has, um, again, a uh, short keypad, but uh, 5Ds of touch are all there. Battery operated, Bluetooth wireless, flawless with uh, Mac OS and with uh, iOS. But of course, Windows Bluetooth um, MIDI is basically non-existent. And it still competes with the Osmos as far as I'm concerned, but the Osmos is good. I'll be one of those pretty soon. Um, underneath there's a cajon that I got, which actually has a, an add-on box for it. The Roland L cajon, so you can actually get digital control from triggers, as well as the actual pop, proper cajon sound. And this one has the, the knob with the snare you can turn on and off. So you can get the snare sound or the hollow sound if you want, which is really cool. Uh, a couple rack units, Yamaha A3000 sampler, classic Kurzweil rack uh, based on the K1000 series from the K250 in the 80s, and this weird PV sample playback unit. Arturia Mini Brute, really nice um, uh, Steiner Parker filter, um, had aftertouch key bed, um, MIDI transmit to other things, uh, engine obviously is monophonic but um, I had a really nice uh, mixer from a single oscillator. You get all these different waveforms and then you have like the metalizer and you have the uh, all kinds of other cool things to just give a lot of different sounds. The problem with this one is they use that kind of rubber surface that gets sticky. So over time, it's a little bit sticky. So you have to use isopropanol to rub all that stuff off and then it's much better. I uh, just found this the other day. Shout out to uh, Sound Source. My friend Manny Fernandez used to do some sound design for them classic uh, high quality patches. I'm not sure if he worked on this model of, of this series of patches, but uh, he's done a lot for the SY77, SY99, DX7, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, classic old thing. And this is actually a cassette in here. I think it's two cassettes, so you have to load it that way, which is pretty funny. Base Station 2, another innovation classic. Um, this one now has the uh, Aphex mode, the Aphex Twin mode, where you can um, instead of just being a, a monophonic thing, you can actually fire off different uh, settings and make it feel more dynamic than usual. It's a, it's a very nice unit. Has a, a, a Wasp-like filter in it because this was designed by uh, Christopher Huggett before he died. And uh, rest in peace. Uh, 
Hydrosynth 49, the first one that came out. Uh, the only problem with this guy is it's missing release velocity, which is unfortunate because MPE kind of requires that as one of its full complements. So it's not 100% MPE, but otherwise it's an amazing scent. And the new updates have made it even crazier. Go look on their website and see what they've done to it. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. X Station, again, this is the 49 key version. So I was saying before the 25 is limiting, but you know what? You got uh, a lot of stuff you can do with this guy. Um, Studio Logic Sledge, an Italian company with the, use the Waldorf wavetables. You got sampling in here and uh, VA synthesis all in one package uh, with the kind of reverse keys here, which is really nice. Uh, let's see, Quasi Midi Raven, goes into dance music. This is very popular when it came out. Um, they had a Revolution 309. The keyboard version of that is called the Sirius. I have it over there just kind of packed up so you can't see it very well, but uh, they made a lot of great stuff. Another product they made was the Polymorph. Klaus Schultz supposedly had about eight of these in a rack for live performances. Quite impressive, lots of uh, complex arpeggiators and other interesting stuff on here. Cool little unit. This one's pretty funny. This is a uh, Timbaland Miko. So Open Labs made several versions of this architecture. This one was supposedly endorsed by Timbaland. There was sound sets on there, samples he approved uh, using the Emu soft tools like the Proteus um, software and a bunch of other plugins on here. This is running Windows XP on a Core 2 Duo Windows system. So. It, quite old these days, but uh, it still works great. You might have to swap out the spinning hard drive for an SSD, but otherwise it works pretty well. You got your control surface, your keyboard, your touch mouse, nice audio interface from Presonus, and a keyboard that's decent on here. But uh, some people are modding them. There's a Facebook group to mod them and change out the motherboard, add a new operating system for modern tools, but I just kept it the same, but uh, it's fun. V-Synth is one of my favorites of all time. This is actually uh, something like that. It's like my avatar for uh, my synthetic channel on YouTube. But uh, Elastic Audio, Time Trip Pad, D-Beam, great control surface. This one has a non-color screen. The XT rack version had a color screen and the built-in D50 and voice cards, which you actually had to add in here with the PCMCIA. Um, V-Synth GT is basically two of these in a keyboard, so it's consequently much more expensive, but they're all really nice. Uh, Casio Privia 320, I just got this as a uh, 88 key weighted controller for Ivory and some other stuff I was doing at the time, but uh, it, it's a nice little control surface for um, stuff. The sounds in it are decent, but they're dated, so I didn't bother getting a new one, but the new ones do feel better and sound better. Um, just a quick tour through these guys on the side here. Alesis Ion VA. Um, pretty pretty interesting little VA. Uh, the mini one's called the Micron. Actually had some more features that the Ion doesn't have, even though the Ion looks fancier. Um, the Korg custom controller with all kinds of goodies. And Sonic Fismo, Transwave synth, very unusual. There are other Transwave synths in the series, but this one has its own custom sets that can't be modified but they're quite interesting. Um, there's a new editor called FAUMO, F-A-U-X-M-O, that lets you edit the crap out of this thing. Whereas you're kind of limited in editing before they came out with that, because it's, it's an older keyboard, but uh, an interesting one for sure. Um, and Sonic SQ80, this is also another Transwave synth. Um, it's basically the sequel to the ESQ1, which is a really nice, Kind of like a poor man's PPG wave, as they call it. Uh, really easy to edit, nice sequencer. Basically like a tiny workstation, but um, uh, it, it's really capable. And they just came out with a version of it on the Arturia collection if you want to try it out and you want to buy it. Sequential Max. So this is in the 80s when they started to go computerize a little bit, uh, interfacing with a computer. So the editing is very minimal on it because you're supposed to hook it to a computer with MIDI and do all your editing with it. Well, the software is very old, you need an old Mac to use it. So basically, um, I was just gonna enjoy the sounds on it because it's really nice analog sounds on it. But uh, there's an iOS app that uses 
the, it controls this and the six track, which is a similar architecture. And basically it's a whole new life to this guy without having to use a computer, just your iPad and really easy touch editing. So that's a whole new blessing for this guy. Uh, Roland System 8, so this had all the plug outs. So you had the Jupiter 8 and the SH-101, System 100, ProMars, all that good stuff. Uh, really worth getting just for those plug outs. But the, the new digital synth on it is quite nice as well. Keybed is terrible, but uh, otherwise it's, it's a nice keyboard. Um, and Sonic Mirage, this is the one that started all for Insonic. Really, really old school sampling, lo-fi, lo hexadecimal, hexadecimal editing, just crazy little box. I saw this in high school and just was blown away by it. And it, it still holds up. It has a real grungy sound, but it, it's a lot of fun, a lot of character. Later on, they came out with the EPS, the original EPS. Um, so this one is really interesting. They have um, uh, probably the first polyphonic aftertouch keybed when this came out, which is crazy because it went away for a while and now it's back and the Hydrosynth and all the new MPE kind of stuff is doing that now. Moog Etherway Theremin. So this is the non-control voltage one. There's an upgrade pack for it and all the new ones do that automatically. But Theremini has built-in MIDI, but I had a hack many years ago to make this MIDI through a weird little box. But a lot of fun, classic Theremin control and tone. But as a MIDI controller, it's fun when you add stuff to it. On top, is just an old Roland TD6 brain. I used to plug into an old controller that I had that was terrible. It had a really bad brain, and I kind of hacked it to work with this brain. Um, some decent V drum sounds on it. Speaking of V drums, behind me is a TD17 KVX, fairly recent uh, Roland system, and I had an extra pad to it there. But it's essentially really, really nice. Um, mesh heads, chokeable symbols, all that good stuff. So I just had to learn how to, I just had to practice it so I can learn how to play it. But it's very, very cool. And because it's MIDI out and it has an SD card on the brain, you basically put any sounds you want into it and don't have to use a computer, which is really nice. Uh, next to it is the SP-1200 recreation by Isla Instruments called the S2400, which does a whole lot more than the SP-1200 did. Built like a tank keeps updating it there's all kinds of fun stuff with it really really nice but really well built and has a lo-fi and the high quality mode so you can if you're a hip-hop guy you can use the lower quality one for effect uh, and then my, my theremin corner has some guitars here an old um, stratocaster cheap one that's my first guitar i bought uh, this is the uh, roll i'm sorry the um, casio pg380 it's an ibanez body with a midi out and a built-in VZ Casio synth brain. And they can all go at the same time. So guitar, MIDI, and synth brain out. And it tracks very well, especially considering it came out in the 80s. So that's kind of fun. We're gonna have some electrics, effects modules down there. They're good for sound design and weird stuff. Uh, and then I got the M-Audio Venom. A lot of people hate this thing, but it's, it's kind of wild. It has some crazy sounds in it. Uh, you can still pick them up pretty cheap, but uh, it was kind of unfinished as far as the software editing goes, but on board it does quite a bit of stuff, especially if you like noisy, grungy, uh, nine inch nails, skinny puppy, and all kinds of stuff like that. It's pretty wild. OB12, uh, so Viscount got the rights to make this using the Oberheim label, um, and it's a VA, and it looks kind of Oberheim-y, but it's not Oberheim, it's, it just uses the name. It sounds quite nice, but a lot of people hate it because it has the, um, the, the Oberheim name, but it's not really Oberheim. Uh, it's the Yamaha SY77, nice mix of samples and FM synthesis. Very good stuff. Okay, over here we have a bunch of stuff on a rack. This is the uh, Kurzweil K2000. So uh, this came out after the original classic Kurzweil series. Vast architecture, VAST really clever uh, emulation of all kinds of synthesis types. Hard to program, but uh, has a lot of classic sounds from that time period. Uh, later, Tangerine Dream, Robert Miles' Children was made with this. You hear all the presets all over the place. It's uh, pretty popular when it came out. Uh, and then they have a physical modeling synth by Techniques of all companies. They made turntables and all that. WSA-1, 
crazy control surface, little ball controllers of various kinds. Uh, it's a digital synth that lets you do things with like, make things more woody, make things more metallic, mixing stuff, samples in different ways to do different things. Kind of like a Yamaha VL, uh, which is just much better. But they're also super rare and very expensive. This is just kind of a fun experiment. Companies like um, Aodio is doing stuff like this now with the Anima Phi and Omega and the Sophia wind controller. So physical modeling is kind of slowly coming back. Uh, then I have some other racks. This is the, the final EPS sampler that came out from Insonic before they got swallowed by Emu. Uh, EPS 16 Plus. Same basic specs with a couple extra goodies that the Emacs 2 had from Emu. This one also has built-in effects, which is nice. Uh, Translates, all that good stuff. Below that's Muse Receptor. Back when uh, people wanted a more rugged PC, they could load their VSTs into this that were authorized. Take it on the road as a hot, really hardened computer. You could use a monitor, mouse, keyboard, but it didn't. Uh, it wasn't as fragile as a, as a typical PC. Uh, interesting little device. Uh, just some other stuff. The Arts Dr. T effects. Emu Carnival custom module of some of their samples for Latino and, and uh, Carnival type uh, sounds. And then you got Emacs One, the original, actually not, it's just called the Emacs. And it's the original Emacs sampler that has uh, analog filters compared to the Emacs Two's digital filters. Uh, it had um, kind of a lo-fi quality compared to the Emacs Two. And then below that is the MR76 and Sonic had a, um, a few other things that came out before they roll up into Emu. It's, um, they basically put uh, a lot of different ethnic sounds in here. They were upgrade cards for it with like tech of drums and African stuff. And really high quality samples mixed with synthesis as well as some of the trans waves. Now we'll head over here to the main part of the room here. There's a Mackie mixer, 24 track. I've been using this for a long time. It's, it's my main controller. All the submixers feed into here. I'll show you the submixers at the end so you see how it's routed. On top is TC Helicon Voice Live 2, an amazing vocal processor. You can do similar stuff like Image and Heap did with Hide and Seek with layering vocals into a choir, like eight voice choir, or playing polyphonic voices of your own voice with MIDI control. Really interesting stuff. Uh, Corgo 1W, my first really nice romper that I like a lot, and uh, it just sounds amazing. Even Jean-Michel Jarre he's done a lot of his stuff. And then you have the Korg Z1. So this one has um, similar features to the Prophecy, but Prophecy's uh, you know, more of a guitar style. Um, you can make it a guitar. It's just a more portable version, and it's uh, this has. You can control like horn fall offs and all kinds of clever physical modeling stuff, similar to like I mentioned on the WSA1, but just a different approach. Uh, classic Akai AX80. So analog synth, digital control, same, same time period roughly as the Juno 6, Juno 60. A DCO analog. I like this one more in some ways. It's a mono out actually, but look at that bar graph, luminescent bar graph controls. Everything is right in front of you, no menu diving. It's really interesting to edit and, and play with. Nice kind of grungy sounds on here. And this little rack here with the, uh, the Kawaii K5000 additive synthesizer. Really wild, hard as hell to edit, but uh, it's, it makes some really impressive sounds. Then the uh, Casio VZ10M. This is the one that was the brain inside the Ibanez guitar sold by Casio that I showed you earlier. You could program it in here and then dump the card into the uh, guitar for mobile use. And they got the TX16W Yamaha sampler. Um, hard to use until you do this Typhoon OS on it, but it's it's interesting for the time period. Then my original Emacs 2. Had this since college. Love this thing. Um, again, not as many bells and whistles as the uh, EPS 16 Plus. But I chose this one over that one because I was just an emo fan from, from the beginning, just the sound quality and the user interface and stuff. And then I have some rack effects down here, uh, Ensonic DP4, uh, Elisa Sakira, 
um, lexicon vortex, all kinds of weird stuff in here. That's kind of wild stuff. And then I have the uh, Yamaha AM1X analog. Um, Virtual analog, basically, really nice controls on the side here. A color coded ribbon controller. Very, very nice analog sounds out of this guy. Um, the control the editing on the side is pretty terrible, so it's better to use a computer editor if you do deep editing. Then I have this weird Arabic controller that I got. It's a, it has a European power supply, so um, it's you know 220 volts, and uh, it just has really nice microtonal keyboard in there and lots of uh, Arabic instruments and stuff. A lot of fun to use. And then Polyvolver from Dave Smith. When he wasn't using the name Sequential, he had DSI for a while, Dave Smith Instruments. So this had the MoFo, the Polyvolver, the Evolver, Prophet 8, and the Tetra. And this is just, it looks amazing, it sounds amazing. You got basically two digital, two analog oscillators, four, four voice polyphony, just a wicked machine. Just really a lot of fun. Uh, then you got a Matrix Brute from Arturia. Uh, Steiner Parker Filter, which for a long time until the Mini Brute came out, um, you couldn't get it without buying a Steiner Parker Synthicon, which is super rare and expensive. So this also has a ladder filter in it, which is nice. So it, they're a lot of fun. This is just my ATEM Mini controller that I use for podcasts and stuff. And of course, on top is the worst drum machine ever made, this little Sony drum machine. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, then a little SP404, my first SP404. We have S uh, compact flash card in it, and Mr. Bill. So, hi, Mr. Bill. Um, then I got the Roland PG300 on top of the Roland Alpha Juno. DC um, analog. So um, it's... Um, you know, digital control it still sounds great beautiful pads on here and sound effects and stuff it's a it's a lot of fun then i got the Korg dss1 kind of like a Korg flagship sampler from the 80s um used by tons of famous bands um kind of a, a chore to edit but the sound quality is unparalleled for the time and then you have the yamaha ex5 this is Kind of encompasses all the best of Yamaha stuff at the time it came out, minus direct FM like six operator programming. There's a there's a module inside to do some kind of FM effect center, but it's not like a typical dedicated FM. So if you wanted that, you still have maybe have to have a DX7 with it to get that. It's an amazing giant 76 key keypad. Sounds amazing. Roland W30, which is the Roland S50, S550 sampler inside of a workstation. Limited memory, but it could do quite a bit for the time. It sounds great. JP8000 from Roland. The original Super Saw synth, all the trance guys went nuts for this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And the D50 with the PG1000 controller, one of my favorites. If you know D50, you know what I'm talking about. Even Jean-Michel Jarre made an entire album with pretty much most of D50 on it. Uh, JD-800 came later, um, higher quality than the D50, but also very different. In some ways, maybe too clean, if you like the kind of the warmer sound that came out of the D50. But the cool thing about this is this, I think it's one of the last of this time period that had um, high quality sounds in it. It actually had 16-bit, 44 kilohertz samples in it. Whereas a lot of later Roland stuff had compressed sounds. So this does sound really nice. Next to it is Waldorf uh, Microwave XT. And this particular module has that thing where the, the UV light or the bright lights actually change the color of the, of the orange from a light orange to this kind of dark orange. But really nice um, wavetable synth. All digital, but lots of uh, motion and lots of crazy timbres that you expect out of a, out of a wavetable synth. And over here we got a few racks, Matrix 6 from Oberheim, uh, Ultra Proteus from Emu, some you know, the Emu samplers, classic Kurzweil stuff in here, even the Kurzweil 2500, so the, the sequel to the 2000 I showed you on the keyboard over there. Um, and this is a Korg uh, M1 EX, so the slightly expanded M1, and the nice little micro cue from Waldorf. 
with uh, it's just a miniature version of the Q keyboard. Similar to the Microwave XT, also bold designs from Axel Hartman. So very colorful. And you got this turbo guy down here, the uh, rhythm mode. <laughs> I've said enough about that one. Uh, Juno 6, so classic DCO. Uh, same time period as the AX80, and also same time period as the Kawhi SX240, which I actually like it better because it does a whole lot more and has some really wicked sounds on it. But this one's a classic. This one doesn't have the memory that the Juno 60 has, but it's the same exact layout, same brain, you know, same basic uh, performance. It's very easy to edit, so presets aren't really required unless you have to do a lot of live shows and you got to punch in the sounds. And Casio CZ1. So their original flagship called the Cosmo Synthesizer in Europe. And the, this had, you know, velocity and aftertouch. Uh, a lot of nice timbre options on it. Even John Majojar used this as well. And this is a nice example of the later in Sonics. The TS-10, really good for trans waves. Really nice mix of all kinds of presets in it with samples and synthesis mixed in. And look at that beautiful luminescent display there. Really easy to read, super easy to navigate, great stuff. Even have the little Reface DX from Yamaha, which has the little keytar handles on it so you can strap it on. This is my uh, one of my submixers, it's a Soundcraft. So it's grabbing this part of the room. There's even a um, Emo command station here, which is nice. It's like the Proteus 2500 and a, and a groove box and the uh, Slim Fatty, and some other stuff down here. Micro Sampler from Korg. Um, so that's that. That's all coming into the Mackie from there. And then from over here, oh, I forgot to show you the uh, AX7 keytar from Roland. Nice uh, ribbon controller, expression bar, D-beam, which is really special because a lot of keytars don't have that. After touch, battery operated, and it looks kind of cool. So, very nice if you like keytars. And so that's that section. Uh, I have a sub mixer over here from Mackie. So that one grabs this part of the room with the, the guitars and the synths and the theremin, all that kind of stuff. This part of the room that you saw earlier with uh, the, the Miko and the X station and all this stuff. This, uh, controlled by this little um, Behringer mixer here, which is just a basic Behringer mixer, but it does the job. And they all go XLR to the Mackie mixer for the you know, master mix. And then I can hook them all into the ATA Mini Pro. It's a single controller for podcasts and making live videos for YouTube, things like that. Quick note on the um, Voice Live 2. And I use that as a as a common microphone interface to go into the A10 Mini. Use a Rode NT1A and a pop screen there. 